I'd like to welcome everyone to the first session this afternoon, which is going to be about a uh, kernel-level GTP implementation that we've been working on inside the Osmocom project. Um, Osmocom is open source mobile communications. Um, okay, so let's start uh, with a introduction about what is GTP at all in the first place. Um, G GTP is the GPRS tunneling protocol, um, which was first introduced with GPRS, which is the packet switched add-on to GSM networks that was first deployed around 1999, 2000, at uh, that kind of time frame. And um, GPRS basically serves to, or is, is there to serve uh, IP, da uh, IP data, user data to a mobile phone. And uh, to do so, it establishes what is called a PDP context. Um, and uh, the PDP context is basically a tunnel that is established from the mobile phone through the entire cell uh, core network and radio access network to the external IP network. And uh, in the original um, GPRS uh, networks um, and edge, uh, to the same extent, it was used between the SGSN and the GGSN node. Um, and th that's the interface here on the right-hand side of the slide. And um, that interface is also the interface, uh, if you're in a roaming scenario, for example, then the entire left part up and including the SGSN is in the visited network and the GGSN is in the home network. And this GTP protocol is then exchanged between operators and makes sure that your IP tunnel always goes back to your home network and doesn't terminate in the visited network. Um, the same protocol is used also in UMTS. In the earlier releases, uh, basically, um, nothing really changed. So you also have an SGSN and a GGSN, and they speak GTP to each other. Um, and uh, as speeds got higher and higher uh, with um, uh, release 7 of the uh, UMTS network architecture, um, actually, GTP no longer is originated by the SGSN but the user plane already can be originated by the node B, which is basically your base station at the edge of the network. So um, GTP is used more um, and by more elements and different elements in the later release UMTS networks. And once we go uh, further to uh, LTE, basically um, uh, there are even more interfaces um, all over the network that use uh, uh, GTP, the GPS uh, tunneling protocol. Um, just for me to get a little bit of an input, uh, is that, uh, is everyone familiar with that architecture or is that a useful introduction so far? Um, who, who, is, who has never heard of GTP before in this room? Okay, that's a relatively large number of people. Okay, then uh, um, I should maybe not have gone uh, that quickly through uh, the, uh, the, that part. But uh, nevertheless, it is used between lots of network elements and um, so far, uh, I mean, you can, of course, buy lots of uh, proprietary uh, equipment from various vendors uh, that implements the functional elements like uh, uh, the SJSN or the GGSN in uh, this uh, slide. Um, but uh, if you look at Linux, uh, so far there's, to my knowledge, only one implementation of, let's say, a GGSN, which brings a GTP implementation with it. Um, and that's a user space implementation. So basically you have user space code that adds and removes your, uh, your, your header and implements the tunneling feature. Um, and that's basically um, something that we try to change um, and we, we will describe in more detail. Okay, getting to LTE networks. LTE is uh, also referred to as 4G networks by some people, the first generation of mobile cellular networks in digital form. Um, it uses GTP even at more interfaces throughout the network elements. Um, so what, if we go back originally, GTP in, in GPRS and in the early UMTS, it was only spoken on the core network side, on the right-hand side of those uh, slides. Um, uh, and then, in, as I said, in later UMTS releases, it has moved to the edge, to the actual base station, which is called node B in this case. Um, and uh, in LTE, this is the normal case. So GTP is already originated by each and every base station that you find in uh, an LTE network, um, and it encapsulates the user IP data over the IP network that is used for transport, for backhaul, basically for connecting your base stations with uh, the operator um, uh, core network. The GTP is uh, passed from 
the node B to something called the SGW, uh, the serving gateway, and then the serving gateway um, forwards those packets to the uh, packet gateway or PDNGW or PGW that then again interfaces with the uh, external IP network. So here on the right hand side uh, of the PGW, you would then have either public internet access or access to private corporate IP networks or whatever you might want to imagine. Um, and GTP serves as a transport medium between those elements. Well, so GTP itself is split into two parts. Um, there is a control part and a user plane part. Um, and now we are in the funny situation that we want to put the uh, user plane into kernel space, um, which sort of sometimes confuses because you have user space, but now you want to have a user plane and that you handle in the kernel. But anyway, um, so don't get confused about the meaning of user in this context. So we have a control plane that exists to basically configure, establish, modify, and tear down tunnels. And we have a user plane which carries the actual user uh, traffic. Um, all of this happens on top of uh, well-known UDP ports. Um, there's two port numbers um, uh, that are used for GTP. Uh, Y2, well, uh, this relates to different versions. We don't want to go into all of the details here, but there's uh, basically version 0, version 1, and version 2 of GTP. Um, and uh, it's spoken, different versions are using uh, uh, and, um, different ports, and also control and, and user plane uh, can use different ports depending on the version of GTP that is being implemented. Um, this, tool, uh, this protocol is specified like all of the other cellular protocols are specified by the 3GPP, the third generation partnership project. Originally they inherited this from the ETSI, uh, the European Telecommunication Standardization Institute. Um, so yeah, once again the control uh, to set up, uh, tear down, modify uh, the actual tunnels and the user plane to encapsulate the user IP data coming from the mobile phone and vice versa. Um, what's interesting is that there is um, uh, identifiers, specific new identifiers to distinguish the uh, individual tunnels from each other. They're called TIDs, tunnel identifiers. Depending on the version of the protocol, they can be 32 or 64 bits. Um, and um, there's one for each direction, so basically, um, or one for each side uh, so, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the tunnel. So it's not only one tunnel identifier, but it's basically one tunnel identifier per direction of your um, connection. And it's the only identifier for your packets, um, not IP port tuples. So um, it basically, uh, it's a bit different from what you normally would look like when you try to find out which packets belong to a tunnel or do not belong to a tunnel. You don't care what the source IP address is, no matter what the source IP address is, if the TID matches, then basically that's uh, part of uh, the, uh, and, and particularly the port number is the same for all of the tunnels. So you have um, basically uh, uh, no way to distinguish different tunnels by, okay, somebody has fun with the light. Okay, um, so you differentiate based on these tunnel identifiers. And there's uh, support for packet sequence numberings and, and uh, basically to, to enforce uh, order, ordering guarantees since it operates on top of UDP. Um, there's some support in that in the protocol. So the control plane protocol is, um, uh, well, uh, you exchange some metadata, you assign addresses to both uh, sides of the tunnel, um, you can uh, specify the DH, uh, DHCP, the DNS server. Um, so DHCP-like functionality, you can specify the DNS servers that the mobile station should be using and you establish and remove those tunnels. And as the user moves across the mobility, uh, I mean the, the different parts of the network, moves across cells, across coverage areas, even from one operator to another maybe, um, then you need to move those tunnel endpoints, of course, uh, from one gateway to the other. So basically, the PDP context, the tunnel between the user device and the core network can stay established while you're changing cells and even uh, serving gateways or SGSNs or, or other uh, uh, parts of the network um, involved. So now I'm going to hand over uh, to Andreas uh, to cover uh, the, a little bit about uh, GTP itself and then the Osmocom implementation that we were working on. Yeah, the user space pro um, protocol, or basically all the control uh, plane protocol as well, um, they have a fixed header, which um, 
identifies the type. Um, mostly, uh, this is, uh, there are only three types, like echo request replies, um, then the user data uh, traffic, and the control data traffic. Now, um, the, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the echo replies are used for, for path maintenance and a bit of length information, so there's nothing that specific there that, that's interesting. So it's, it's a relatively simple, I mean, you see the six, fixed header, I mean, we don't need to spend time about explaining that. There can be some TLVs at the end, but for the user uh, traffic that we're looking here to move into the kernel, it's a relatively simple header, straightforward to parse, straightforward to continue. Now, the question is, uh, well, what um, to do, uh, uh, or what's the problem with user-faced uh, GTP? Well, that's pretty easy. Um, basically, um, we uh, have the problem that with GPRS and the speeds at that time, like talking about kilobits or tens of kilobits or maybe hundreds of kilobits if we're happy per subscriber, then of course you don't mind doing all that in user space, even if it's a lot of subscribers, it will not add up to really significant data rates. But if you move to more modern cellular technologies uh, like HSPA and particularly LTE, the world has completely changed and uh, you definitely have uh, a very large uh, bandwidth that you need to handle at those uh, central elements in your network. And the control plane traffic is very limited, um, of course, and um, uh, therefore it can stay to continue to be processed in user space. You have your actual implementation of that network element but the user plane you try to move into um, the kernel, and that's basically what Andreas is uh, going to explain further. Yeah, so I already said the, um, the, the data tra uh, traffic becomes more time uh, critical and more bandwidth uh, hungry, so uh, handling this in user, pl uh, user, user plane introduces latencies that we want to avoid and hope to um, reduce those latency by putting into the kernel. Um, the control plane makes absolutely no sense to put them into, uh, into the kernel. Um, there are the uh, TLV pairs that uh, transport all the information and they simply have no place in the kernel. They are not interesting there. Now, to, um, to actually uh, establish the user data uh, tunnel, we only need a few information to provision from the, from the user plane to the kernel. This is basically the IP address of the, the station that uses the, uh, this tunnel, the endpoint address of the SGSN we want to talk to, and the tunnel identifier. Yeah. For that, we use the net, uh, Netlink-based uh, API. Yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the whole implementation was actually started quite a while ago, in 2012, by, by Harald and uh, Pablo. Now, apparently, their customer at that time disappeared, and so this um, lay around on, on some, some kind of Git repository until uh, I discovered this um, late last year, I think. So, well, I'm not actually fixed, Harold, and, and the Pablo's bugs, but um, I introduced new ones, I think. Um, also, the old implementation, being three years old, didn't take uh, network namespaces and this kind of um, things into account. So I added that a bit. And obviously, during, during those years, um, a couple of tunnel support code in the, the kernel um, appeared and changed. And so I uh, adapted that to that as well. Um, also, because for, for the specific project I need that for, um, we want to run the outer tunnel, uh, the encapsulated packets, into a different network namespace than the user data tunnel, uh, the user data traffic. And so, as far as I know, it's uh, at the moment the only tunnel protocol in the Linux kernel that um, works cross uh, network namespaces in a way. Yeah, the, the Netlink uh, API, um, this changed a bit in the uh, with, with the, with the new, new version, but it's still bu uh, built on top of uh, GAN Netlink or GAN NL um, for, to actually set up a tunnel well, you first need to discover the uh, GNLL ID. Then we create the GTP socket in user space. Actually, we create two sockets in user space, one for GTP v, uh, v0 and one for the um, version, uh, version one. Then we pass that on to the network, uh, to the kernel, to, to work on those sockets and bind, 
bind these sockets to a TAN-like uh, network interface. The TAN-like interface is used to, to capture the traffic from the, from the user and uh, route it through the, through the tunnel then. <coughs> so to, to identify which tunnel we, we want to use, we create a, a PDP context structure which um, contains the relevant information like the IP address, the, the tunnel endpoint identifier, actually two tunnel end, endpoint identifier, one for the incoming uh, packets, one for the outgoing packets, and the remote endpoint for the SGSN. Uh, yeah, we had already had this with, uh, with again another um, thing. Now, um, one thing uh, with, with, with GTP is that on a single IP address, you can actually have one endpoint, and that endpoint needs to be managed by the same control instance. So, so you can't have a, a um, PG, PGV or GGSN IP shared by different control instances. That's because the, the tunnel identifier need to, um, can't collide on, on that endpoint. They need to be unique in every direction. Um, following that, we, are, we also use only one tunnel, only one uh, virtual uh, Ethernet interface to capture the traffic and direct it um, through the endpoint into the tunnels and then onto the mobile network. Yeah, also, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you have a million subscribers, you don't want a million ton devices on your Linux box. It doesn't make sense. You just have one device to basically uh, route all the traffic uh, to, and then uh, basically everything coming into that device um, uh, gets uh, basically, based on the IP address, gets mapped into which, uh, into which PDP context it belongs, and then forwarded through the correct tunnel to the respective subscriber. So, um, yeah, the, the current implementation at um, basically supports GPU in uh, version 0 and version 1 for IPv4 uh, packets over IPv4. Now, GDP um, generally is uh, designed for v6 and v4, both uh, as uh, transport protocol as uh, well as user data protocol. Um, but the current implementation and only um, knows how to handle v4. It's mostly because um, I couldn't fi uh, figure out how to do the v6 stuff right. Um, but so this is planned for the near future to do that, to implement that. Uh, we support, um, this should yeah, probably uh, not be multiple tunnels, but multiple PDP contexts, um, but only at the moment one, one APN. That's uh, an implementation limitation that hopefully will disappear soon as well. What doesn't work, it's, uh, as I said, the V6 support. Um, still need to understand how to do the, the packet forwarding there. And then the other big topic is um, all the different offload mechanisms. They are currently uh, simply disabled, so there is definitely not a bit, a bit of performance uh, lacking at that, point, uh, at that place. Now for the implementations, um, the, the um, original kernel support was written for the open GGSN, and that is still working or progressing. And then we also have a new implementation which is written completely in Erlang. Who knows what Erlang is? Ah, we got a few people. So um, that's open source as well. Um, I would like to invite you to try it out, to contribute hopefully. Maybe you can get a fully working um, GGS MPGV in Erlang as well. Yeah, and then the always the to-dos, well, clean up submission, uh, clean up so that we can submit, uh, submit it to mainline. There's um, still, I think, a lot of work ahead. And then the V6 support, with, which we already discussed. Now, there are a few questions left. Um, and um, I hope that some of you can, can help with that. Um, one is how to implement MTU discovery if we really need it. Um, the specifications itself um, simply say um, to send the packets, uh, the, the um, GDP packets out with the DF flag cleared and leave the fragmentation to the first hop that um, uh, has to frag uh, do the fragmentation. Now, on production networks, uh, usually the MTU was much larger than, than 1500, so you don't have to worry about that at all. 
Um, but I feel that for a Linux kernel implementation, we should in some way at least uh, try to support that. Um, the biggest thing there, I think, is that there are all the other uh, tunnel technologies, they in some kind of way implement the MTU discovery or path MTU discovery, but everybody uses a slight variation of the, of the mostly the same code. So there might be an opportunity to unify that, that support across the different tunnel technologies. And then, of course, the, um, the offloading, which I'm still trying to understand how it uh, should be done correctly. Um, one of the topics probably for a, after we have the, the mainline inclusion, or at least have reached a certain stable state, would be to investigate how to integrate this with lightweight tunneling with the LV tunnel infrastructure. That would be especially useful to be able to use something like OpenV switch to build a, a GTP switch. There currently is a user space um, a project that does exactly that, that um, takes GTP tunnels from an SGV and forwards it to, to any number of GSNs, but doing this completely in kernel with, with an open flow switch might uh, make things much more flexible there. And also directing the tunnels through a routing-like entry could probably save us a lot of infrastructure work that we currently have to do in the HTTP kernel model, module to um, direct the packets. Okay, and then brings us to the end of what we wanted to uh, basically give you an update on what we've been working on. So if you have questions, comments, feedback, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, use the microphone, please. Uh, that will be passed around in a second or so. Yeah, microphone is being switched on. Maybe we can uh, meanwhile also work on this microphone since it has been explained to us. Ah, okay. Okay, <clears throat> I have uh, three questions. Uh, first of all, do you also support uh, TCP GTP tunnels? Or uh, no. plans to do so? Okay. Um, and and I've, I've spoken with, with a uh, carrier and apparently they don't use it at, at all. <laughs> So as far as they are concerned, uh, UDP only is completely fine for, for real production networks. Well, I know for sure that we have customers that do use uh, TCP, GTP. Uh, yeah. so I only spoke to, to one carrier, patch? there might be different. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and um, the next question is, uh, regarding the network namespace, you said that you can do cross network namespace, but what if I want network namespace separation? Is it supported as well? Or you, or, you, or you by default uh, make a, a crossing between network namespaces? You can run both the endpoint and the user traffic in the same net, uh, network namespace. That works as well. Um, but for our use cases, you want it separated. So the user uh, traffic is in one network namespace. is rooted there. And we have another uh, network namespace in which we terminate the actual tunnel tra traffic. Or the, the endpoint, the tunnel endpoint, the, um, the sockets. I see. And uh, one last thing, uh, the code that you described, is it the, the last code on your uh, Git tree on the internet? Uh, the last version is, I think, not in the Osmocom Git. Um, <coughs> there, there are still some, some patches that need to be reviewed before they go into that Git repository. The last version is currently on, I think, on, on GitHub, on my repository. Be because I, I tried from the Osmocom to clone the Git, and we tried uh, on three different kernels to compile it as a, as a kernel model, and there are a lot of compilation errors, yeah. looks when, like that. When did you do that? Um, last time I did it just before I left, a few days ago. Yeah. I tried with kernel 4.4.1, and another guy from my company tried with, I think, 2.6 and 3.0. I don't remember, he tried with two versions of Ubuntu and uh, gave up. and. I said maybe you're just using the latest one, and I tried 4.4.1, and um, there's some discrepancy in that in uh, what kind of structure of net devices it expects. Look like there's a it was based on totally different kernel version, a really bad gap. Maybe just you know the the Git is not updated on the internet. I'm not sure, but. Uh, yeah, the, I think the Osmocom um, Git has not all patches yet. Um, there were some, some review things that need to be addressed. Um, but I definitely have it working on 4.4. Um, 
I can can give you uh, that um, if you follow the the RGB link in the presentation, there uh, the same repository should have the the kernel module. But it, um, as, as we said, um, we are working on getting the the patches integrated. So hopefully next week or so it will be on the Osmocom Git as well the the current version. Yeah. Okay. If you have spare time afterwards, yeah. I have the laptop here. Oh, I can show you. Can you give you know, your, the yeah. URL if you want? Let's to. try to give some other people a chance to raise their questions too, please. Um, so comment about some of your limitations. The no offload support. As long as you're using the normal UDP kind of encapsulation interfaces, you should be able to get checksum, receive, and transmit mostly for free. And TSO, GSO should work on the basis that this looks like a UDP sort of encapsulation. So we kind of already have support. This, this is basically a foo over UDP scenario. The only offload that you'd probably have to have special code for is Jira. That's just by nature of how Jira works. It kind of requires that. And then, so I didn't quite understand though, the, the IPv6, this is just because you haven't gotten around to it or is there some actual reason not to do it? Um, well, ju just haven't got, gotten uh, the time to look into that uh, in detail. There was some code from Pablo and from Harold there in place already. Um, because I changed it around, I think I broke a bit of that and um, the IPv6 support was just stops. So um, just have to, uh, have to find the time to look into that, how to do it right. Well, so is, is this, so the GTP itself, is that something that's you're t intending to become a standard in IETF? No, it is, it is a 3GPP standard. Um, it's not related to IETF. It's a 3GPP standard and it's deployed uh, in, in the field for, what, 15, 16 years or so. Okay, so, so that standard's only defined for IPv4 then? No, no, no. 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 It's, it's just fine. Yeah, okay. it's all specified. There's nothing architecturally why it shouldn't work. Okay. It just needs work, that's all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So just so what you know, I'm working on a path MTO issue for VXLAN and the other tunneling implementations. It's probably exactly the same issue that you're having as well. Um, what I'm currently exploring is to kind of give feedback from the underlay into the overlay that if the packet was dropped because of MTO, you, you provide that feedback so you can generate an ICMP in, in your inner, inner header contact. I think that's what you need as well to, to, to resolve path MTO issues. And I would be glad to help you out with, with uh, lightweight tunnels as well. It's really not difficult. Um, it's really simple. So I think move that up from the wish list to before you actually submit the patches. I think that would make a lot of sense. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your attention and have fun with the other talks. <laughs> thank you.